All right, so I'm Olid, and uh, today I'll be discussing a new framework that we have introduced called Redden, uh, which essentially allows you to offload any arbitrary code to RDMA, uh, proving that RDMA is in fact uh, Turing complete. So before I get started, let me talk a little bit about the benefits of RDMA. Uh, so one of the major things about RDMA networking is that it allows you to bypass the kernel, and it also provides some convenient abstractions such as RDMA read and write, uh, which allows you to manipulate remote memory. Uh, now, one of the downsides of this is that you can only manipulate remote memory, but if you want to do anything more complicated, you obviously need to involve the server CPU. Um, RDMA has importantly uh, been witnessing massive growth in the processing power of RDMA NICs. Uh, so as we can see here, uh, the Connect X NICs, which are produced by NVIDIA, uh, they, the, there is almost a 2x increase in the processing power uh, for each generation. Um, and one of the advantages of this is that now we have some extra processing power that we can likely use, for example, to offload application code. So this is, presents an opportunity for us. Now, there are many existing designs for RDMA-based systems, and I'd like to quickly classify uh, some of the design decisions that go in these systems. So there are one-sided approaches when it comes to offloading um, R for, for RDMA systems, and these one-sided systems rely on verbs like, uh, one-sided verbs like RDMA read and write, and one of the downsides of these systems is that because they're limited by the RDMA API, if they want to do any more complex computations, uh, they essentially have to do it on the client. So this can mean extra round trips going to the server back and forth. There are also other approaches like two-sided, which is essentially implementing RPCs over RDMA. Uh, now with these approaches, the the obvious downside here is that you're consuming server CPU resources since you're no longer re reliant on the one-sided RDMA verbs. There are also a class of NICs that are more advanced, so-called smart NICs, uh, that basically come with FPGAs or ONDI CPUs, and you can leverage these to perform uh, more complex offloads. Now, the obvious thing here is that these uh, Smart NICs uh, are obviously more expensive than commodity RDMA NICs, and they're probably less available as well. So the alternative design that we're proposing is to try to exploit the RDMA NICs processing power. And to do so, we basically propose the idea of performing complex operations by using so-called RDMA chains. So by that, I mean you basically have RDMA code that, or RDMA operations that are posted on your work queues, and you want to use these operations to perform more complicated functionality. So what we propose here is to use a so-called verb called RDMA wait, which is not very well known or and not very well documented, and it's proprietary to NVIDIA's NICs. Now, the benefit of RDMA wait is that it allows you to add execution dependencies between your RDMA operations. And this can allow you to do more complex things because basically the output of one RDMA operation can also become the input of another RDMA operation. So that is one benefit of having that. The second benefit here is that it also allows clients to trigger server-side RDMA code. So in this particular example, the RDMA receive uh, number one is being triggered by an RDMA send at the client. And after the RDMA receive finishes, it will basically trigger all the remaining operations in the chain. So this allows the client to flexibly trigger RDMA operations that are posted, pre-posted on the server. So now we have a very simple programming language using RDMA that provides a somewhat richer API than what comes with the traditional verbs, and it also doesn't require any hardware modifications. But the main question is, is this Turing complete? And the reason we care about Turing completeness is because we want to see if we can use this language to perform arbitrary offloads to RDMA NICs. So to be Turing complete, there are multiple requirements that need to be satisfied. So first, there is a requirement to be able to read and write to arbitrary amounts of memory. And the second requirement is to have conditional branching. Um, now, let's first look into the first requirement. The, fr the first aspect of requirement R1 is actually already satisfied by RDMA since you can basically do reads and writes using traditional RDMA verbs. Uh, 
Now, the second part is a little bit tricky because to do that to an arbitrary amount of memory, if you want to adhere to the pure definition of Turing completeness, you need to also have a way to do loops or recursion. So basically, we have two requirements now that we need to satisfy, conditional branching or if and else statements, or, uh, and the, set, the third requirement would now be to have support for loops as well or recursion. So let's explore this. Let's first start with requirement R2, which is to do conditional branching. Now, our main insight here is to do conditional branching, one thing we can do is to use self-modifying RDMA code to control the execution of operations. And this can be done because of the fact that these RDMA operations are posted in memory, which basically means that they can be modified by other RDMA operations. So in this example, the RDMA write two can basically provide, uh, can basically modify the RDMA write operation three and change it into a no-op. So it's basically modifying the code uh, as it's being executed. Now, this is not exactly conditional because this will execute every time and you will end up with a no-op every single time for this execution. So you need to have it execute in a conditional manner. And to do so, we found that the compare and swap verb, which is actually available on Commodity Nix, can be used to do that and to conditionally execute certain operations. So let's explore how that can be done by utilizing a very simple example here. So on the left-hand side, I have the pseudocode showing a very simple uh, if statement, uh, basically checking the equality for two values, x and y, and if they're equal, returning value foo, if they're not equal, returning bar. On the right-hand side, I'm showing the equivalent RDMA code that can basically be used uh, to execute the logic that is shown on the left-hand side. So let's start off by explaining what we have here. So every block corresponds to an RDMA operation, and we first see the, check the attributes for this operation. So now we're looking at the opcode, which basically shows what type of operation we have here. The next attribute we have is the ID field, which is basically a numeric identifier that can be modified without changing the behavior of these operations. And we'll see later on how that is relevant. Starting off, we have the receive operation, and the receive operation is basically responsible for receiving inputs from the client. Next, we have a compare and swap operation, and what the compare and swap operation does is that it compares two values, uh, and if they are equal, they basically performs a swap. So the old field is the value being compared, and the new field is the swap that is being done if there is a match. After that, we have a no-op operation, which as the name implies, basically does nothing. And then we have a write operation that returns the value back to the client. Now, by default, if you've noticed, the data field in the write operation indicates that the value bar is being returned back to the client, which is the value that is being returned if we hit the else uh, statement, essentially. So this is what we have by default. Now, let's see how this works in practice. So let's assume that x is actually equals to y. And let's see how this code operates. So first, the client will send the data, which happens to be, in this case, the values being compared, x and y. The receive operation will insert y into the old field in R2, and it will insert it into the IT field of R3, x. After that, the compare and swap compares two values, no op y and no op x, and checks if they're equal. In this case, since x is equals to y, the equality checks out and the compare and swap will actually perform a swap. So it will change the no op into a write operation. So this basically means that R3 is now executing a real operation now. So what R3 is going to do is that it's going to replace the value in R4 from bar to foo. So now R4, which is returning back the value to the client, is going to return foo instead of bar. So this is essentially how you can basically do a simple if statement in RDMA. So that satisfies the uh, requirement R2, which is to implement conditional branching. Now the question is, how can we implement loops, which is requirement R3 for Turing completeness? Now, one observation that we've made is that the RDMA operations are not deleted after execution. So they are still located in memory inside the work queues. They're never deleted by the NIC. 
So this presents an interesting opportunity because we can now recycle previously posted RDMA operations. We simply need to find a way to instruct the NIC into how to recycle these operations. So after the NIC executes these series of operations that I'm showing in this example, we basically found that we can use another proprietary verb called RDMA enable that instructs the NIC to refetch and re-trigger this entire chain. So that basically means that once the RDMA enable is executed, the NIC will be instructed to recache and re-execute all of these operations. And in doing so, we can invoke the code that has been posted as many times as necessary. Uh, and now we have another way to implement, uh, basically have a way to implement requirement R3 for loops. So to summarize our framework uh, that we denote as Redden, to give you an overview, first, uh, we post the code on the server. And the code could be posted in, let's say, high-level language, if and else statements. And it can be translated by perhaps a compiler into RDMA code that is posted on the work queues. And this is all happening server side. Now, this only needs to be done once because, as we mentioned, with the possibility of loops, the code can be invoked as many times as necessary. So we only need to do this once. Now, the client will then trigger uh, this code that has been posted by using a simple send operation, which, as I mentioned, can then trigger the chain of operations that are pre-posted to the server. And this can be done as many times as necessary by the client. It, uh, it's basically a simple function invocation. And as I mentioned, because of conditional branching and loops, uh, we now show that RDMA NICs are, in fact, Turing complete. So let's move on to the evaluation. Uh, our experimental test bed uh, is comprised of three nodes, and it comes with 3.2 gigahertz uh, running on 16 cores and 100 gigabit per second dual port Connect X5 NIC. We evaluate Redden using a variety of use cases and micro benchmarks. In this case, I'm only going to be focused on memcached uh, for brevity, but you can check in the paper for more uh, use cases and benchmarks. So first, let, let's check what is involved with memcached lookups. So in this case, I'm focused on the memcached uh, key value store and how it performs the lookup operation. So memcached uses a hash table, and every time you need to do a get or a lookup, uh, you need to have a way to basically walk the hash table. Um, so to, uh, to, to show you how the hash table looks like, it's basically comprised of a bunch of buckets, and every key uh, based on the hash, can be located uh, and its corresponding value in one of these buckets. And typically, inside a bucket, you have a key, and then you would have a pointer that points to some value associated to that key. And so in order to do a lookup, you need to have a way to uh, essentially walk this hash table and return the value back to the client. Um, so let me walk you through the RDMA code that is uh, shown here. It's very similar to the if condition that I've introduced earlier, so I'm going to go really fast on this, but you can obviously check the paper for more details on how it works. So first we have the receive operation, which receives the input from the client, and the input here is simply the key and its hash. And then you have a read operation, which performs the actual lookup. So the read operation uses the key and its hash and reads the bucket itself. After that, you have a compare and swap operation. And the value of this compare and swap operation is, an, is to have an if condition. And the if condition basically checks if the key provided by the client is equivalent to the key in the bucket. If it's not equal, then you have a hash collision. And we actually have a way of sorting that out, but I'm not going to mention it here. Uh, but if there is no hash collision and the key is a match, then what you want to do is to basically return the value. So what the compare and swap does uh, is if there is a match, it basically overwrites operation four into a write operation that returns the value back to the client. So that's a summary of how the lookups are performed using the Redden framework. Now let's take a look at the results. Um, so here we have um, Redden and, and two other baselines. Um, so on the y-axis, I'm showing the latency in microseconds. On the x-axis, I'm showing various value sizes for lookup operations that are being performed. Um, so the first baseline, which is called one-sided, is very similar to uh, farm KV, for example. It only relies on one-sided reads to perform a lookup, which basically means that it requires multiple RTTs. 
once to fetch the bucket and then another RTT to use the pointer in the bucket to fetch the value. Um, we also have another baseline, which is two-sided, and this is essentially vanilla memcached sped up using a library called VMA, which allows memcached to utilize RDMA. So this is essentially our way of speeding up vanilla memcached to make it more competitive. And as we can see, uh, Redden outperforms all of these baselines at all the value sizes that are shown. Uh, and we outperform one-sided because we don't require extra RTTs in the network. And we outperform uh, two-sided specifically uh, at higher value sizes because two-sided requires extra copies uh, from the network buffer to the key value store. Um, in this result, we also wanted to see uh, the performance isolation properties of Redden. So we wanted to check out the contended case, what would happen if we have CPU contention. Uh, so on the left-hand side, I'm showing the latency in microsecond. This is basically for the average in the 99th percentile. And the x-axis is basically showing different levels of contention. And this is basically increasing the number of clients so that we increase the CPU contention on the server. And um, we have two systems that we're comparing. We have Redden shown in red, and then we have the vanilla memcached uh, shown in black. And as we can see, because vanilla memcached utilizes the CPU, what happens as we increase contention is that the latency increases exponentially, reaching up to uh, 200 microseconds. Whereas uh, the latency for Redden basically stays the same since it's not utilizing the CPU at all, and there is no contention there. So that potentially raises uh, Redden uh, to be used in scenarios where you want to prioritize certain traffic, for example, uh, so that you only run it uh, on the NIC offload without having to contend for CPU resources. Now, to conclude, uh, Redden has shown that RDMA is Turing complete, allowing us to perform arbitrary offloads on the NIC. Uh, and in doing so, it basically unlocks the door for many potential use cases of offloads with RDMA, spanning things like distributed locking, consensus, and so on. So I think there is a lot of interesting things that can likely be explored with Redden. And um, if you want to check out the code, uh, you can go into redden.io, and uh, you should be able to access the source code and try it out for yourself. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, happy to take some questions now.